G'day, g'day, and welcome to Tartarian Truthers with your host, Casey and Jojo. Last episode, we briefly mentioned ley lines and we imagined living in a place where wireless technology existed. And, you know, those in our community believe in a free energy fireplace, but we are yet to really understand just how they work. I guess if we knew, we wouldn't be here trying to figure it out, huh? And we hear about past civilizations that were far more sophisticated and advanced that apparently harness their energy from the ether or maybe even the earth itself. If this is in fact true, how is it that somehow between the fall of that civilization and us, it is lost? Or is it? Today we're going to be looking at the weird and wonderful world of chimneys, fireplaces and the possibility of free energy. In order to properly understand energy and how it pertains to our chimneys and fireplaces, we need to go back and take a look at the evolution of the fireplace. So exciting. (laughs) But just bear with us and we'll try not to make it too boring. In 1185, homeowners moved their fireplaces to the outside wall, which led to the invention of the chimney. Then in the 1600s, the... Hang on on a second. Did we just jump from the 1100s to the 1600s? That's that's almost 500 years with no evolution whatsoever. (laughs) I know, right? How strange. And were we really that backward in moving forward? (laughs) (laughs) seems that way doesn't it so in the 1600s the fireplaces were so big they were called walk-ins they were tall deep and wide often without a mantle made of stone or brick to retain heat better then we jump forward to 1740 where benjamin franklin created the franklin stove made of cast iron By the late 1700s, we have the introduction of the fireplace becoming the centrepiece of the home with decorative features such as mantles. And then Count Rumsford designed a new fireplace that lasted right into the 1900s that was smaller and taller than its predecessors. Then the first electric fire was invented in 1912 before becoming immensely popular in the 1950s. Okay, so let's just jump back quickly, Jojo, to what was going on between 1185 and the 1600s, because that's a huge jump, right? So let's take a quick look at what our history books tell us about what was going on in this time period. According to HistoryCentral.com, a lot was going on in this time period, particularly in the 1200s. You can see Sicily, Danish, Chinese, the French, English, Middle East, and even Africa. But of course, no mention of Australia during this time. Apparently, we didn't have a history, and you won't see any mention of us here or anywhere until, of course, the Cook era. It's as though we simply didn't exist. Weird, huh? I digress. What caught my eye was this mention of coal in 1239 AD, not long after 1185. A royal charter was issued in 1239 for the development of coal fields in Newcastle. This began the rapid development of coal as a source of energy. So here we can see that coal for energy may have started in the early parts of the 1200s. And it's interesting because coal has been said to have been utilised for heating and cooking since the beginning of time. But its use for energy is said to be a fairly new development. Looking at a brief history of coal, it claims that there is evidence of use of coal for heating by the caveman. And that's if you believe in the theory of evolution. In the 1300s, Hopi Indians in North America used coal for cooking and baking pottery. Then, a big jump to 1673, where it is claimed that coal was rediscovered by explorers in the United States. 
Interesting, right? In the 1700s, the English found that coal could produce a fuel that burnt cleaner. Hmm. But by the 1800s and with the first and second industrial revolution, the claim is that the burning of coal to generate electricity was a relative newcomer in the long history of this fossil fuel. It wasn't until the 1880s when coal was first used to generate electricity for homes and factories. So what was going on in that big gap? Are we to believe that our ancestors living, say, between 13 and 1700, were using coal primitively, as we imagine the caveman did? Apparently, there are so many inconsistencies because in 1239 AD, they were already investigating the use of coal for energy. So it doesn't make sense if it was a newcomer in the 1800s. I'm so confused. I mean, looking at this timeline of our major eras, which is a version of events that most of us have simply accepted as the truth, and with all that was supposedly going on, what with the exploration of the 1500s, the Renaissance period between the 1300s to the 1600s, yet we have no improvements or even history of the use of coal being used for energy. So what were they using then? I know, right? They expect us to believe that we are at the peak of humanity, but looking at early depictions of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance period, and then the 1800s, and, you know, an apparent time of enlightenment, that we went from this to this to this. And, you know, this last image is of Australia, by the way, and I believe the rest of the world were probably living in similar or better living conditions than that. I feel that we are, in fact, devolving. What do you think, Casey? Mm. Yes. In American English, devolution. In British English, devolution. In Australian English, devolution. A process of constitutional reform whereby power but not legal sovereignty is distributed to national or regional institutions. It's a whole dumbing down of society, basically. Don't forget that while we were living in homes like this in the 1800s, we were also building these little old things. This little castle is known as Sydney University, established in 1850. And why the heck were we building this when we were told that our people were living like this? And this picture simply labelled children on the streets of McGrath Lane, Sydney, in 1875. This is a reset picture if I ever did see one, Jojo. And those people look like they are the survivors living amongst rubble and dirt and dust of a fairly recent event. And there's always kids, but no parents. Lisa of Tartarian Tales mentioned also that in a lot of the, the photos from that time period, there don't appear to be any images of old people always young children or Mm. you know right up into maybe the 20s and 30s but you don't see much older than that Mm -mm. how odd you know while we're researching actually the 19th century chimneys at this time period we came across this picture which really had us thinking views taken during cleansing operations quarantine area sydney 1900 Sydney was struck with an epidemic of bubonic plague. George McCready, a building engineer, was put in charge of quarantine and cleansing operations to get rid of slum buildings in the Rocks and Paddington areas, which were thought to harbour plague-carrying rats. These children lived in Millers Point. Clyde Street no longer exists. The street and all the houses were demolished in 1901 as part of the plague cleansing operations. These buildings wouldn't have been that old, but somehow rats ravaged by the bubonic plague ran all its residents out of some very desirable areas. It wouldn't surprise me if it was to hide old world architecture and perhaps to make way for ugly new world designs. I know. And, you know, I think this is a bit of a sidebar, but I can see how the powers that be can really control a narrative as we've just witnessed firsthand during the last two years. 
Mm. <clears throat> Definitely. Mm. And some of those old homes in Miller's Point still stand today, and the old world fireplaces remain a central piece of the home. Mm. Beautiful, aren't they? Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, you know, Casey, another anomaly that we found was that chimney sweepers apparently were only a relatively new yet short-lived career once electricity was introduced. That's right. So chimney sweeping rose to prominence in the 17th century as houses grew in size and fireplaces needed regular cleaning. And of course, each home was taxed depending on how many chimneys they had. But this article goes on to say, chimney brushes were not invented at this time. So chimney sweeps took on young boys as apprentices to scrape the creosote out of the flues. Boys were indentured to the chimney sweeps at around seven to eight years old and came from orphanages, parishes, and were sold by their families. The master sweep was paid a fee, which was to feed, clothe, and teach the child his trade. Some of them grew to become assistants to the master sweeps, and others took up other trades when they could no longer fit inside the chimneys. In London, there was the London Society of Master Sweeps with its own set of rules one of which said that boys were not required to work on Sundays but must go to Sunday school to study the Bible. Conditions for the children were harsh and sometimes cruel. Some were forced to sleep in cellars on bags of soot and washing facilities rarely existed. Cancer of the testicles was a common illness amongst the boys and was contracted from the accumulated soot. There were no safety regulations or safety clothing to protect the boys and there are instances recorded where they were choked and suffocated to death by dust inhalation whilst trying to sweep clean the chimneys. They often became trapped in the narrower flues or fell from the rotten stacks to their death. Only in 1864, after many years of campaigning, was an Act of Parliament finally approved by the House of Lords to outlaw the use of children for climbing chimneys. Lord Shaftesbury's Act for the Regulation of Chimney Sweepers established a penalty of £10 for offenders. This was a considerable sum of money in those times. It's almost like the inheritors didn't know how to use the chimney, having to use the young boys to clean them. And it's just so weird. It's like that time period, you know, between 13 and 1600s is completely forgotten despite the major transformations going on, what technologies were they using at that, time to, at that time to heat their homes and structures? And were the late 1700s really a time of enlightenment? I don't know about you, Casey, but do you think that maybe this was the time period that energy was free? Maybe. You know, it's been theorised, Jojo, that red mercury and even radium was used to generate power back in the day, distributed on some sort of wireless grid. And also in our modern day, there are claims that we are able to harness energy from the ether. And he is said to have been the pioneer of free energy. Nikola Tesla stated that electric power is everywhere, present in unlimited quantities and can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other of the common fuels. Tesla was a Serbian-American inventor and engineer who discovered and patented the rotating magnetic field, the basis of most alternating current machinery. He also designed and built the Wardenclyffe Tower in Long Island, New York, an early experimental wireless transmission station. Tesla intended to transmit messages, telephone and facsimile images across the Atlantic to England and to ships at sea. But check this out. His decision to scale up the facility and implement his ideas of wireless power transmission to better compete with Marconi's radio-based telegraph system was met with refusal to fund the changes by the project's primary backer, financier J.P. Morgan. Additional investment could not be found and the project was abandoned in 1906, never to become operational. And then it goes on to say that the tower was demolished for scrap in 1917. So they destroyed it. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Okay, and our awesome bearded mate Tim forwarded an article written by Tesla in 1902 
where he writes with enthusiasm and excitement of a possible wireless new era. In this remarkable and complete story of his discovery of the true wireless and the principles upon which transmission and reception, even in the present day systems are based, Dr. Nikola Tesla shows us that he is indeed the father of the wireless. To him, the Hertz wave theory is a delusion. It looks sound from certain angles, but the facts tend to prove that it is hollow and empty. He convinces us that the real Hertz waves are blotted out after they have travelled but a short distance from the sender. It follows, therefore, that the measured antenna current is no indication of the effect because only a small part of it is effective from a distance. He shows by example with different forms of aerials that the signal picked up by the instruments must actually be induced by earth currents, not etheric space waves. He was incredible. It's so sad that his work has been suppressed. And in this image here, you can see an artist's rendering of Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower, how it would look if it was completed. And on the right here, we have the Milford, Texas Tower. So what's that about? This article here is from a local Texas newspaper. And it states that sometime back, a mysterious tower resembling Nikola Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower appeared outside Milford, Texas, a rural community in north central Texas. The construction of the Tesla Tower was noticed by citizens of Milford in 2017, but only more recently, it has become a fixture of the landscape. Anyone heading down I-35 can get a clear view of it from the highway. It stands alone in a field unusual and looming. So we now know that the company responsible for this tower is Visiv Technologies and their aim is to utilize electromagnetic waves that use the surface of the earth as a guide enabling signals and electricity over long distances. In their mission statement, they claim that their mission is to bring surface waves technologies to market in a safe, environmentally conscious and reliable manner, improving living conditions across the world. Hmm. Wow. They sound like they have the same goal as Tesla. Mm. <laughs> so why do we pay for energy today then, Jojo? Well, Casey, you see, there was a war. And not the kind of war that you're thinking. Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison were going head to head in the battle of energy, which is also known as the current war, which was at the turn of the century in the late 1800s and early 1900s. ACDC and no, not the legendary Aussie band, but this. Alternating current versus direct current. And instead of us reading all this to you, let's just watch this short clip. On June 6, 1884, Tesla arrived in the United States. He was hired by Thomas Edison to do basic electrical engineering, but moved up to redesigning the direct current generators that ran Edison's business. Edison offered Tesla $50,000, or about $1.1 million in today's currency, to make these improvements. After completing this assignment, Tesla asked about the payment for his work. Edison didn't pay out the money. He claimed that he wasn't serious about the payment, that Tesla didn't understand American humor. Tesla eventually left Edison's company and partnered with George Westinghouse in 1888 to commercialize his system of alternating current. The problem here is that alternating current competed with direct current, which Thomas Edison built his entire monopoly on. Thus began the War of the Currents. Edison started a massive smear campaign against Tesla and alternating current, trying to scare people away from using it. He spread false information about it, lobbied against its use, and went so far as to electrocute a circus elephant in public. Basically, Edison was a jerk. Direct current had plenty of its own faults. It was the cause of death of countless children and created numerous house fires. Also, the maximum reach of direct current was about two miles, which meant a substation had to be built to continue the current. To this day, they would still be building substations if they were going to get electricity across the U.S. Tesla's alternating current could go for hundreds of miles. Lights running on alternate current were bright white, unlike dull yellow lights running on direct current. Eventually, Edison had to give in to the demands of the people and had to go with alternating current. 
Tesla's influence spreads much further than electricity. He had over 700 patents and came up with ideas such as robots, spark plugs, the electric art lamp, an x-ray device, bladeless turbines, wireless communication, laser technology, neon lights, remote control, cellular communication, radio, an electrical bath to remove germs, radar, and much more. Tesla died from heart failure in a room of the New York Hotel on January 7, 1943. Despite his fame and influence on the world, he died with significant debts and all alone. While Edison is known as the inventor of the century, Tesla is only acknowledged as a paragraph in today's history books, forgotten and unappreciated. Thus ends the story of Nikola Tesla, genius and inventor. This makes me so angry. Poor Tesla and Edison. Ugh, he sounds like such a stand-up guy, huh? So, what else do we know about Edison, anyway? Surprise, surprise. Masons Among Us, brought to you by Michigan Masons. He has been described as America's greatest inventor. His devices have greatly influenced life around the world, including the phonograph, motion picture camera, and the light bulb. Dubbed the Wizard of Menlo Park, he holds 1,093 patents. His name, Thomas Edison, a proud member of the Masonic fraternity. Brotherhood, fellowship, community. Be a Mason. Go to wearethemasons.org to find out more. Thomas Edison was an inventor and entrepreneur whose Masonic spirit brought forth worldwide illumination in the form of inexpensive electric light. Masonic spirit? Are you serious? I am so not surprised. But hang on a second. Inexpensive electric light. I don't know about you, Jojo, but my electricity bills used to be pretty big. And to think that we had another option that was clearly quashed because of its inability to generate income to line Edison's greedy pockets. Crazy. And, you know, so now we can see that Edison was in the Schmitration Club. And, of course, it seems like they all were. Although I really couldn't find any info lending to Tesla being involved in the club, which I think is the reason why he was pushed out along with all his research and patents. So apparently there was a movie made in 2017 called The Current War, a historical drama on the battle between Edison and Westinghouse. I believe Tesla does make an appearance, but I'm surprised that he wasn't the main opponent of Edison's in this movie. Yeah, well, of course he wasn't. They'd prefer to erase him and his free energy ideas from the history books, right? Mm. Can't put him in a, in a mainstream blockbuster movie, hey? This episode turned out to be massive, so we've decided to stop right here before we get into chimneys and fireplaces themselves. We hope you've enjoyed this episode thus far, and we hope you stay tuned next week for part two. Bye, everyone. Oh, 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 oh,